Okay, so we're going to have an English language question and answer session. Uh, I don't know, did anybody <coughs> write any questions? Are there? Hmm? Uh, if, uh, if there are any questions already written down, um, could you please bring them up? Otherwise, um, you can either write them down now or um, just ask a question like a normal human being with your mouth. Pasatai. <clears throat> okay, these are all Thai questions, so <clears throat> we can maybe leave those for this afternoon. Would anybody like to start ask something in the English language? Or you can ask in Karen language and the novice can translate. You want to write down a question if you're shy? No one want to ask anything at all. We can just sit meditation without moving for an hour instead. <laughs> Okay, question. Yeah, as far as I understand, in, in, in China, quite a lot of the money just uh, goes straight to the government. Um, and one, I think one, one part of the revenues are, um, are, are devoted to renovation of monastery buildings. But uh, in, in, in China, then the monastery is expected to be like, economically sustainable which is a different idea than um, in Thailand. So the, um, one, one important principle is uh, to be found in one of the rules in the monk's discipline in which um, the Buddha created a um, a protocol um, by which the Sangha could declare a particular, vil a particular family as off-limits for arms round, for Bindabhat, or um, that monks were not to receive offerings from that family at all. And the reason being that they were too generous. Um, they they were just so full of faith. They just want to give, give, give all the time. Um, and they were um, be locked before long. They were going to be bankrupt. Um, so um, the Buddha, when he saw families like this, um, rather than encouraging it and saying, oh, you know, so much merit for them, um, quite the opposite. He would say, no, this is beyond puddy. This is not um, the right way. Um, to make merit. So making merit um, is accomplished by three different kinds of activities. Uh, one is uh, through giving, through generosity. The second is through keeping precepts. And the third is through pavana or cultivation. And the reason 
um, why those are called meritorious um, activities. And merit here is the translation of bun or bunya, is that they increase the quality of your life. Um, they raise up um, the the heart and the mind to a higher level. So um, when we're talking about an increase of inner purity, inner happiness, inner quality, this is obviously not something that can be measured with money. You can't say that this much money will purify your heart this much, this much more money will purify your heart even more. Um, because the the main um, condition for the purification of the heart is your intention. So if you if you're giving money, for instance, but your main uh, motivation is to um, get something in return, whether it's um, some material benefit or whether it's um, a good reputation or fame, um, then that motivation will um, reduce the purification of your heart that takes place. Um, there's, it's more like um, a transaction than a purification. So if you would, when you give something without desire for something in return, you can see the difference in your feeling. This isn't like a philosophical position here. And you can, anyone can observe when you give something with a desire to get something back, it makes you feel one way. And when you give something with no desire to get something back, you feel another way. It's as simple as that. And that feeling of giving and sharing with no wish for anything in return is something that makes the mind very bright and clear. And it's, um, and that's what we call merit or bun. So the, um, like the putta panit, you know, the, um, that, um, we see in, in, in Thailand and in Taiwan and, and China and many different places. Then, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's trying to, uh, monetarize or to, um, turn something which is not measurable into something measurable and to use people's greed um, as a tool to um, manipulate them. Now this is one, again, one of the reasons for um, practicing Dhamma is that human beings are so easily manipulated and this, if you read history or in politics or the modern world, you see how even the smartest people are so easily manipulated. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know the way your mind works, um, then you're constantly going to be prey to people who do know how the mind works. This is how, you know, on one level, uh, this is how advertising works, isn't it? Um, you, you, uh, advertising draws upon the um, the insights from psychology uh, to find people's weak points. So this this is um, a point to, to worthy considering that <clears throat> when you want to manipulate, if someone wants to manipulate someone, it's their defilements that are their goal. The more defilements you have, the more easily you are misled, uh, the more easily you are manipulated. So uh, in the, the Putta Panit um, phenomena, then uh, the manipulation is of the greed for bun, the greed for merit. Um, so because people don't understand what merit is, um, then they think it's something that you can get or something that you can buy uh, or something that you can measure. Um, and this is the, the foolishness which is 
um, manipulated by unscrupulous monks and unscrupulous organizations. So the idea of uh, the, the Buddhist monk and the Buddhist monasteries um, ideally um, are um, demonstrating to the lay Buddhists that it is possible to lead a very happy and very fulfilled life with an absolute minimum of possessions. That mon monks and monasteries don't really need that much money um, to live a good monk's life. Um, but once they get into huge building projects and, um, and more uh, luxurious lifestyle, then there's a big demand for funds. Um, but for monks to live a normal and productive monk's life, they don't really need very much at all. In the life of a monastery, there'll be one or two big occasions where you need to build a sala or a boat or something like that. But it is just in the life of a monastery, that this, um, these things don't occur very often. Yeah, you want to ask something else? Well, actually, yesterday a young boy was asking, um, what is, I don't know what now means in English. Now, we usually say, when some of us make marriage, say, I just make marriage, I don't want to know anywhere. And we read, what's in the mm -hmm. book, that we have it. So, the people who, or animals who are not want to yeah. realize it, some who don't, I hope you get it too. Now, what's the difference there? Yeah, okay, so the question is about the meaning of anumotana, or how you would say anumotana in, in English. Um, so th there isn't really an Engl a direct English equivalent, um, but the meaning is uh, that anumotana is an expression of appreciation of goodness. <clears throat> Um, so it's um, it is um, of of the um, the positive um, emotions. Um, it is an expression of mudita. So the four brahma viharas or positive emotions are the wish for other beings to be well, and the wish for them to be free of suffering, and then the ability to. Um, find joy in the goodness and success of others, um, and fourth, stability and evenness of mind um, in the midst of all the ups and downs of life. So these are four emotions which are cultivated in Buddhist practice. <coughs> so mudita is expressed with, verbally expressed as Anumotana is an expression of appreciation. Um, so when um, a lay person makes an offering to a monk, um, the monk doesn't say thank you. Um, he says anumotana, or he chants an anumotana um, verse, a verse of appreciation, because by giving um, to a monk, then someone is performing a good action, is making merit, and the monk expresses his appreciation of the merit that has been made. So, um, in the uh, dedication of merit to those who've passed away, then the merit it, when we say a transference of merit, or utit suan kuson, um, it's not um, primarily or not solely dependent on the person who is um, dedicating merit. For the merit to be transferred, the recipient has to anumotana has to express appreciation. That is the key, um, the key feature of a transference of merit. Um, one question that comes up quite a lot is, uh, you know, these days uh, we talk about um, sharing merits with 
family members or with people um, who are not here. And um, people say, is that, is that possible? You know, to, you know, come and do a good thing and then share the merit with parents or with someone who, who's at home. But again, it, it's not um, like you do something and you send it, like, you, you know, you send an email or something. It's um, when you do a good thing uh, and that person um, recognizes that and appreciates it, um, then something really beautiful happens in their heart through their appreciation of your goodness and the good thing that you've done. Um, and that's how they receive merit from their appreciation. So if you you were to um, perform good actions and that person didn't know or was completely indifferent or um, uh, thought it was a stupid thing to do, then um, there wouldn't really be um, that um, sharing of merit or sharing of goodness. It's a... Okay, I have an English question written down. Um, the question is, since daily life is quite busy, I'd like to ask if I have to choose uh, between meditation for 20 or 30 minutes and pray or sut mon, which do you suggest and why? Um, just a word about translation of, of Buddhist terms. Like the first generation of, of translators often use Christian terms to translate Buddhist technical terms and um, can uh, give rise to a lot of misunderstanding. So pray, you know, pray, the word pray uh, presupposes a God who you pray to. Um, and in Buddhism we're not praying to, we're not chanting to anyone. So the correct word for Sutmon would be chanting. We chant. Um, so even even though um, life is very busy, I know, um, I think it's possible to make time for both chanting and meditation. The, um, to, the, some people um, have a real affinity with chanting. That means when they chant, their mind gets very peaceful, and they uh, give rise to a lot of joy. In that case, then you can do a little bit more ma chanting, maybe, and not so much meditation. But uh, for most people, um, the meditation is just a, a preliminary. Um, the real work of mental purification um, takes place during the meditation rather than the chanting. The chanting is a good preparation. It's a, a basic kind of meditation, but uh, not a particularly profound one. So it's a good preparation for the application of uh, meditation technique. But I wouldn't suggest um, chanting instead of meditation. But, um, if you can just find a little bit more than 20, 30 minutes, you know, maybe uh, sleep for 15 minutes or 20 minutes less than you usually sleep and see whether if you don't become sleep deprived, then it's quite a, um, you've made a profit. And you... Okay, I have another English question. Uh, this, this, by the way, is something that is worth um, investigating. You know, how how much sleep do you need? You know, people, everyone's um, different. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, maybe you're sleeping too much. Maybe you're not sleeping enough. Um, then experiment a little bit and and see what the effects of less and more sleep are. You know, if you're sleeping for half an hour or more, 
more than your body needs for suffi- and to get sufficient rest, then you know you've got another half an hour in which to do good and useful things, and particularly in the morning to um, spend more time in meditation. So, um, if you if your mind's very peaceful and you reduce the amount of food you eat, particularly uh, in the evening, um, that uh, reduces the amount of sleep you need. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, monks and nuns and lay people on um, sort of more intensive retreats don't eat in the evening is um, the mind is much brighter in the evening and you're not giving it that extra work of digestion which takes the energy from the body and then leads to a need for more sleep. So um, eating very uh, light meal in the evening and not too late in the evening um, is one way of reducing the need for so much sleep. It's also more healthy. Um, how to deal with takers. Uh, many people want to take advantage of my goodwill. Well, the, um, you know, there is this idea of, uh, that kind people are, are an easy touch or easy to take advantage of. Um, but the, the Buddha um, never taught kindness and goodwill as an isolated virtue. It's always within the context of these four positive emotions that I mentioned just now. And um, accompanying goodwill and kindness, um, there must always be ubeka or equanimity. And this is um, a, uh, in- involves a love of Right, the, what is right and correct, and the um, sometimes people asking for favors and things which um, are um, um, incorrect or involve some dishonesty, for instance, and um, some people can get into a real mess by. Um, making compromises with their ethical standards um, because of kindness or because of sense of kring jai or bun kun, for instance. So there has to be this um, um, understanding that we we help others and we find joy in, in helping others, um, but within the boundaries of our um, responsibilities and our ethical code. Um, if we go outside of that, um, then we'll get, we'll get into real difficulties. The other important point is that with metta or kindness or goodwill, um, the most important person that we need to start with is ourself. And we need goodwill towards ourselves. And if we um, take on too much, then uh, we get exhausted and we start to get depressed or negative or just burnt out. And our ability to do good for others um, becomes much less. So in terms of having a positive impact on one's surrounding, looking after your own mind and metta for yourself has to go hand in hand with metta for other people. And you need to have firm and clear boundaries which you make um, um, you make clear to those around you. This is my boundary. I can only do so much. And whether these are ethical boundaries or emotional boundaries, um, it's clear that you establish what are the boundaries that you can live within comfortably and sustainably and make those clear to those around you.
Uh, how does focusing on our breath and other meditation techniques help to purify our mind and lead to wisdom? Yeah, good question. Um, to begin with, you know, we um, we can only um, really be aware of of um, say the let's say if we're in a boat and you're just Uh, floating along with the stream, then it's very hard for you to have any any sense of how strong that stream is. Um, only when you turn against the stream and try to paddle against the stream can you have much idea of how strong that stream is. Similarly, um, the word gilead, or defilement, or impurity, or whatever you want to call it, um, that doesn't really mean very much um, until you go against that. And the, the method of doing that is to take up a meditation technique um, and then say, stay with this object, for instance, the breath, for the next 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And once you do that, then you expose all of the defilements in the mind. Um, so all kinds of uh, greedy thoughts arise in the mind, all kinds of negative thoughts, dullness and um, laziness and depression and anxiety and, and uh, agitation and doubts, all these kinds of negative mental states become um, manifest to you as mental states. See, this is the difference. These things are usually going on all the time. You know, we have some greed arising, some anger, some um, sadness, some depression, but we take them all to be, this is who I am, this is what's happening to me. And we take everything very personally. But when you um, put your... Um, um, take up a meditation object, then all these mental states um, are exposed as simply mental states, things that arise and pass away according to causes and conditions. They're not who you are at all. Um, and they wax and wane, they increase and decrease um, through the way you handle them, the way that you relate to them. So this is the first um, wisdom that arises, um, that all these things that you formerly thought, these are who I am, and maybe felt very proud of the fact, or felt very um, unhappy, um, these are not who you are, these are mental states, and that you can free yourself from identification with them um, through this practice. So we have um, um, a number of things that we need to do and need the skills that we need in our life if we are to find any happiness and purity. One of them is we need to be able to protect the mind from unwholesome dhammas. That means from all kinds of defilement. Okay, so... Uh, let's take anger. You know, if someone gets angry, then they can do anything, basically, in a moment that they're angry. You know, and people who um, kill somebody, for instance, you know, people with, which are, are called murderers, you know. And someone who's a murderer, maybe they, they live their life for 30, 40 years, 50 years, um, never did anything particularly bad. Um, and then um, just one day, just got this so much anger coming up and there was a weapon nearby or they, the occasion um, helped them and they killed somebody. And so their whole life had turned upside down in a matter of seconds. And as long as we have this kind of temper, then we really can't 
um, be at all confident um, in our uh, in ourselves as um, someone who um, is free from those most terrible kinds of actions and greed and jealousy and depression and anxiety etc all the uh, the modern mental illnesses um, that are like epidemics in the world um, today, um, unless we train our mind, we can't ever be sure that we are protected from them. You know, when, once you've contracted one of these mental illnesses, maybe there are pills and things that might help to um, take them away or make them uh, reduce their intensity but the wise way is to prevent them from occurring in the first place. So this is one of the reasons for uh, developing meditation. You say, yeah, my mind is strong enough that no matter what happens, I know my mind won't sink into um, depression and it won't develop an anxiety disorder because I have the inner resources to um, protect myself from those kinds of um, complaints, but in in the case where um, very negative mental states um, do arise, a second life skill that we need is the ability to let go of those negative mental states. And most people never develop this skill at all. And when they get very unhappy, um, start to suffer then they just tend to uh, revert to a habit. Um, some people eat something um, to make them feel better. Some people shop, spend money. Some people take pills. Some people take alcohol. So these are all the strategies that people with no mental resources use to deal with life. And the Buddha, um, <laughs> the Buddhist way is saying, uh, these are not very intelligent strategies for dealing with um, bad experiences in life. And that um, the training of the mind will prevent these things from happening. Um, but if the mind does um, develop some negative traits, then we have the mental strength to let go of them in a very natural way which doesn't have side effects on our physical and mental health in the long run. But we also um, need to develop skills of developing wholesome and good and joyful mental states in our life. So we're not constantly feeling we're missing out on something or we're, we're lacking something. And so, you know that, that sense of it, it's never quite right, it's never quite good enough. And we always think it should be something more than it is. And we don't have the um, inner um, happiness. We're always having to look for happiness outside of ourselves. So the well-trained mind is one which is naturally happy um, because the causes of unhappiness um, are um, unable to affect the mind. And we're constantly cultivating these good qualities like kindness and generosity and so on. In particular, uh, mindfulness is, um, is absolutely key to a healthy and happy mind. And meditation techniques are basically mindfulness techniques. At least in the beginning, we're mindful of the breath. Um, so this is uh, how we... Um, these are skills that we learn in meditation that we really can't learn so well in any other activity in life. And then when we do develop good qualities, then they don't become uh, fixed and stable very easily. They're still very um, weak and um, vulnerable. So we have to look after them like a young plant. We have to water them and care for them and the good qualities in your in your heart that you develop through meditation. Similarly, um, you have to have the skill and the, um, the intelligence to know how to make those flourish even more.
So this is the way that the purification um, of the mind takes place. We're starting off um, giving the mind that, that stability where it's not pulled this way and that way by negative emotions. And when the mind is stable and clear and bright, then it has the um, capacity to see things how they are, to see things as they truly exist, um, rather than through the, um, the filter of uh, mental defilement. So the Buddha says that basically we don't understand ourselves, we don't understand the world that we live in, and not understanding um, this world, then we um, live in a world of delusion. And the, uh, the mental training is to see through the uh, attachments and delusions that we create for ourselves through the power of wisdom. But that wisdom can only um, work and can only do this work um, when it is fortified by the, the strength of samadhi. And samadhi can only arise in that way when we have developed mindfulness until it is uh, continuous and stable. Any more questions? You can just ask a question if you like, who would like to ask. Nobody want to ask anything else? Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> okay, this is gonna Wow, there's a lot of questions. เราครับพบคำว่าจิตวิญญาณอยู่ด้วยกันบ่อยครั้งหนังหนึ่งจิตกับวิญญาณต่างกันตรงไหน so um, in Thai there is the the phrase จิตวิญญาณจิตวิญญาณ um, which is composed of the word จิต and the word วิญญาณ and the question is to what degree are they Um, the same, or and what degree are they different? So, uh, yeah, this is probably um, more suitable to an answer in Thai. But generally, um, you can say in Thai language, um, there are certain advantages in in talking about Buddhism in Thai. Um, obviously, Thai is a language um, which is very heavily influenced by Buddhism. So in the in Thai language, it's basically a, a, a tonal Chinese monosyllable, syllabic language, with a huge import of Pali and Sanskrit words. Probably, I think, probably forty percent, um, or maybe thirty, forty percent of words in Thai language um, are Indian imports. <clears throat> so we have a Chinese Indian. Um, Uh, composite language. Now, many of the technical terms in the um, Buddhist teachings um, have been imported into Thai, and then we pronounce them in the Thai way. Um, now, over the course of many hundreds of years, a number of these words have uh, that have entered the Um, the language, everyday language, have changed in their meaning, and so it can be confusing when you listen to a, a dhamma talk, listen to a talk from a monk, 
uh, when he uses words that you are familiar with, but uses them in a um, slightly different way. Now, for instance, the word samatha, you know, we say in Thai, oh, he's, he's very samatha, means uh, he's like, lives his life very simply. So samatha has come to mean simplicity, or riyap ngai. Uh, whereas in Pali, um, the word samatha uh, refers to um, the calm or peace of mind uh, developed through mental cultivation or pavana. Another word um, is mana. So we use mana these days um, in uh, um, to mean um, someone who's hard working or determined or passionate about their 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 work, their projects. Whereas in Pali language, mana means conceit. And you know, conceit means when you measure yourself against somebody else, where you say, I'm better than he is, or I'm worse than he is, or I'm just the same, he's no better than I am, we're all on the same level. These ideas about yourself, uh, which come from measuring you against other people, it is a, a defilement called mana. And uh, in its very crude forms, it can be very being very proud and arrogant, or it can express itself as being contempt, and it's contempt, looking down on people, um, <clears throat> or being very, feeling very inferior and feeling other people are so much smarter than I am, so much more good-looking than I am. So all those ways that you compare yourself with others are called mana in Pali. So when we talk about Buddhist topics in Thai, um, some, some words um, that we know are, have pretty much the same meaning as they do in the Buddhist teachings, but some are quite different. So we have to be very careful in that way. Now in English, um, the problem is, um, is different in that there are a number of concepts in Buddhism which are not found in Western culture. So translators have usually uh, had to make difficult choices um, because most of the spiritual words have specific Christian meanings. So if you start translating um Buddhist terms with Christian words, then you can often get some confusion and some wrong understanding of Buddhism without realizing simply because you're translating with words that have slightly different meanings. But then if you make up your own word, um, then uh, which uh, you think is closer to the meaning, but it sounds weird to... Um, an English or a, a Western ear, does a hearer, then they feel this is really strange, I don't understand this. So this is always um, a problem. Similarly, when you translate the Western words into Thai, um, for instance, the word sin in Christian teachings, now how would you translate that into Thai? So almost everybody would say bap. Yeah. But bāp and sin are two very different concepts. And if you, uh, if you consider the same thing, then you, you'll misunderstand both the Christian teachings and the Buddhist teachings. Um, in Buddhism, bāp means any action of body, speech and mind which increases the defilement in the mind. So you could say it takes you one step or several steps away from um, Nibbāna. So anything that makes the mind more coarse, it increases the amount of greed and hatred and delusion in the mind is Bāp. Whereas in, <clears throat> in Christianity, 
the the basis not on in human psychology. It starts off with the teachings in the Bible and the belief in a creator God who decides um, what he wants human beings to do and, and how he wants them to behave and how um, he does not want them to behave. So someone who um, acts in conflict with the desires or the uh, wishes of God um, as recorded in a book, like the Bible, um, is forming a sin. And in the Catholic Church, then, there's a whole um, um, development over hundreds of years of, like, gradation of this is a big sin and that's a small sin and this sin. You, um, and so because the... the um, the idea is that sin is an offense against God. Then you have the idea, well, you can pray to God and ask him to forgive you for your sins because it's a matter between you and him, as it were. So if we were to compare it with a political system, it's like a dictatorship. So if you, you do something wrong, but you, happen, you are able to speak privately with the dictator and he forgives you, then that's the end of it because he has absolute power. He's the dictator. But in, in Buddhism, the, um, we, it's a completely different idea. So there's no idea of a creator god or someone who has power to uh, punish you or reward you but that um, there is a law of nature, a law of kamma, and that when you act with greed, hatred, and delusion, then the, uh, the intention increases the amount of greed, hatred, and delusion. Now, very simply, if you, are, if you have a certain amount of greed in your heart, and then you act greedily, then the power of the greed increases every time you act greedily, and that's the bar. Or if you act uh, angrily, every time you act with anger and hatred, then you increase the power of anger and hatred in your heart, and that's the bar. So we're, we're talking about the qualities of the heart which increase and decrease through the way we re lead our lives. So the word jitta, this is a difficult, how do you translate jitta or jit into English? You see? So in English, you see, you have two words, don't you? You have heart and mind. So what's the difference between heart and mind? Well, it's not so clear, but um, mostly we use heart to mean, to refer to emotion and mind to refer to, like to the brain and intellect. So in Western culture, you, you have two things. You have the mind, which is like rationality, and you have, you have the heart, which is emotion. <clears throat> so where does jitta... Yeah. Um, I'll get on to that after I finish here. Okay. So, um, so jitta is... Um, the early translators have... Um, sort of had different opinions, some translators heart and some translators mind, but the jitta includes both the rational and the emotional aspects. Um, and so if you translate jit as heart, then you miss the intellectual side. If you translate jit as mind, then you um, run the risk of um, overlooking the, the the emotional side. So um, jitta includes mind and heart. It is the the sense of knowing, or the um, the vijnana in Pali is um, a word referring to um, sense experience, the first level 
primary sense experience. So if you hear a sound with your ear, that's vijnana, that's the vijnana which arises because of it, the ear and the sound. And then you see something with your eyes, um, and that's a different vijnana. It's the vijnana which arises dependent upon the eye and the visible form. Or you have a, a physical sensation, and that's a different vijnana. It's the vijnana of the body sense and the sensation. So there's not one thing called a vijnana. Vijnana is, and then there are six different kinds of vijnana who are constantly flowing between the two. It's, so it's a process, it's a flow rather than a thing. So in um, vijnana um, can be um, used more or less um, uh, as, as a synonym for jitter as meaning more or less the same thing or a certain aspect of the same thing. So when um, Thai translators came across words like um, soul and spirit, then they had the same, you have the same problem. Well, we don't really have concepts of a soul or a spirit in the way that they have in the Western culture. So um, they make up words which use Pali words and put them together, like jit vinyan. So you, this is how it gets very confusing. You have um, non-Buddhist ideas which are translated using Buddhist terms. And so then you think, is this a Buddhist? What is this? Is this Buddhist t- term or not? Um, <clears throat> so it's more of a, um, a problem um, that arises and when you have words that have no equivalent in your own language, you use words in your own language and then tie all the words to do with the, um, the, material, the immaterial world are Buddhist words, and then you come up with these weird um, combinations like jit vinyan. And then after a few years, people hear these, and then people start using them in a Buddhist sense because they sound kind of modern and, and, and cool or whatever, and it becomes even more confusing. So, um, basically, Jit Vinyan um, is, is a, a modern phrase that um, is, was used as a translation of a West, non-Buddhist Western concept and has then been used in Buddhist contexts by people not aware of the, the background of the, the word. Is that clear? Probably not. Okay, well, um, we were going to have a um, period of sitting, so just for the last 10 minutes or so before the midday break, let's all just sit quietly.